While all eyes have focused on the COVID-19 pandemic over the past year and a half, there is another terrible health emergency unfolding, the opioids crisis. It was bad before, it's much worse now, with fatal overdoses up 60% in Ontario. Joining us now for a closer look, we welcome Dr. Quam McKenzie, CEO at the health policy nonprofit, the Wellesley Institute, and a professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. And Dr. Hassan Sheikh, emergency and addictions physician in Toronto and assistant professor in family and community medicine at the U of T. And it's good to see you two again. Happy to have you on our program. Uh, let me just start with a bit of a fact file to set the scene for our discussion to come. According to the Public Health Agency of Canada, between January of 2016 and December 2020, more than 21,000 people died from opioids. In the year 2020, 17 Canadians died every day from opioid poisoning or overdose. The federal government has not released the numbers for 2021 yet, but Justin Ling, the journalist at McLean's Magazine, has looked at the provincial numbers for this year, and here is what he found. British Columbia reporting that 1,011 people died between January and June of this year. That's up 33% over last year. Saskatchewan reported 221 deaths between January and August. That's already two-thirds of last year's total deaths. Ontario counted 638 deaths between January and March. That's 57% higher than in the same period last year. All right, Quem, how would you characterize what we are facing in Canada at the moment with opioids? Well, we're in a very difficult position. We've had a war on drugs, but it doesn't seem to have worked with regards to opioids. Um, we, I know we've been going through the pandemic and we've been... Uh, worried about uh, COVID, obviously, for good reason. But in some places, uh, such as BC, uh, more people have died in the last year from opioid addictions than, than COVID-19. So when we start thinking about it in those terms, you can see that uh, we're in a really bad place with regards to uh, op opioid deaths. Hassan Sheikh, to what extent do you think the pandemic... COVID-19 pandemic, that is, has made the opioid situation even worse than it might otherwise have been. Yeah, it has certainly made the already dire situation much worse. And you put out some numbers there. You know, when I talk to my patients, it's been a desperate situation for them. You know, the pandemic has made us all scared, more anxious. And that's when people who use drugs are at their most vulnerable. And in addition, we've asked people to actually socially isolate at this time. So they've lost whatever, you know, minimal social supports they had, and they're using a loan, and that's an extremely dangerous time for people. There was a question uh, last week in the English language leaders' debate that related to the OBR situation. Are you, Quam, to you first, are you satisfied with the amount of attention the opioid crisis has received during the election campaign? Well... As a mental health uh, advocate, I'd always like there to be more attention to mental health. Uh, but I don't want it just to be during the campaign. I want uh, uh, some focus on mental health now and focus on mental health for whoever gets into power afterwards. So I, I, I um, always want there to be more talked about, but I don't want it just to be in the context of an election I want it to lead to real change. I appreciate your position. Uh, Hassan, how about for you? Uh, obviously, myriad issues out there that the candidates, the leaders have to consider. Opioids did come up in the debate. Were you satisfied with that? I really have not been satisfied. You know, the last 18 months have shown us how we need a central plan when it comes to a public health emergency and the opioid crisis is a public health emergency and we don't see the same proper, well-thought-out plan for that. All four of the major parties running in the province of Ontario do have uh, things to say about the opioid crisis and what they are promising to do. And I want to take just a moment now to briefly outline some of what the parties have on offer. So, Sheldon, if you would, let's bring this graphic up here. Starting uh, with the Liberals, the uh, Liberals would propose to invest $25 million for public education to reduce the stigma associated with problematic substance use. They've got $500 million in their plan for a full range of evidence-based treatment, and they'd like to reform the criminal code to repeal relevant mandatory minimum penalties. 
The Conservatives, the second place party in the last parliament, would invest $325 million over the next three years to create 1,000 residential drug treatment beds. Law enforcement should focus on dealers and traffickers, say the Conservatives, and all policies have the reduction of harm and promotion of recovery as their objectives. The NDP would immediately declare the overdose crisis a national public health emergency. They would purport to create a safe supply of medically regulated alternatives to toxic street drugs and end the criminalization and stigma of drug addiction. And the Greens declare that the drug poisoning crisis is a national public health emergency. They would create a national safe supply of drugs of choice and decriminalize the possession of illicit drugs for personal use. Let's, uh, you know what, I think maybe the best thing to do here is just, with all of that having been said, let me get, uh, Quam, to you first, your expertise on what you, what stands out for you there as being particularly useful or relevant given the challenges afoot. I'll just give you a bit of context in how I'm thinking. So one of the things that has happened during the pandemic is that we've had a significant change in who is actually uh, dying from opioids. And uh, we've got more people uh, who are not in contact with services or who would probably never have been in contact with services and more accidental deaths because of a toxic supply of fentanyl. So we've seen the supply of opioids change to make them more dangerous. The reason I say that is because if we're thinking about saving lives, just increasing treatment will not do the trick because a lot of the people who are dying are not people who would be in contact with services or who uh, believe they need services. Uh, and a lot of people are dying because of accidents because now the supply of uh, a particular opioid fent fentanyl is so toxic that very small amounts will kill people. So if we want to deal with that, we have to do something about toxic supply and safe supply, as well as doing something about treatment, which means that we need to really, really change up what we're doing. So when I see, uh, and I think the, the platform seem to bifurcate, on the one hand, we've got the NDP and the Greens saying we need to fundamentally change things. And then on the other side, we have the Conservatives and the Liberals that seem to be saying in their platforms, we need more of the same. Uh, and my view from the research and from all of the policy work that I've seen is more of the same, more treatment and all of the other things, that's good, but it won't actually solve the problem. You need something much more fundamental if you want to really save people's lives. Okay, Hassan, uh, again, I'm not asking you to endorse anybody's platform in particular, but what stands out as being particularly useful here? Yeah, I think what really stands out to me is what seems like an uh, artificial distinction between treatment and harm reduction. When I think about almost everything I do in medicine, it's all harm reduction. When I treat someone's diabetes, I'm not curing their diabetes. I'm reducing the harms of high blood sugar. But when it comes to people who use drugs, we seem to have made these artificial distinctions where you're either for you know, safe supply and decriminalization or you're for kind of recovery and abstinence-based treatment. And I think that's really dangerous. And I'll give you an example of why. You know, For some of my patients, they live in sober housing where you know they can't use substances or they lose their housing. We have a housing crisis where if they do relapse, they have nowhere to go. And so they have to choose between keeping their housing or using in the bathroom of a fast food restaurant alone when they're at highest risk. And we make people make these impossible choices as opposed to providing a large spectrum of options, reducing the barriers between them and letting people, you know, get the treatment they need when they need it and where they need it. And that's not the fundamental shift that I'm seeing in these platforms. Okay, a couple of follow-ups here uh, for you, Hassan. Number one, um, we're not ignoring the People's Party here, but from what we saw in their platform, they did not speak to this issue. That's why they were not on the list uh, of what we just enumerated. 
Second thing is, you know, there was a time, Hassan, in this country when, when the Conservative Party was very much more focused on uh, punishment and a, a sort of a criminal approach to this. And they seem in this campaign to have focused much more on uh, harm, reduc harm reduction and sickness treatment. Um, at least they've been getting a lot of positive notices for that. Have you noticed that in what they have on offer? So I think it's a step in the right direction. And I would say it's a tiny step in the right direction in the sense that they are kind of saying globally that they embrace harm reduction. But if you look at their actual platform, there's a lot of uh, wording around, you know, living a drug-free life and, you know, increasing treatment. And when we force that paradigm on people, we actually create real harms. And so I think what we really need to see is a shift towards an idea of a comprehensive set of treatments and reducing the barriers between them. And Quam, my follow-up for you on this is, and I, and I ask you this question, given that you were the co-chair of Health Canada's Expert Task Force on Substance Use, where you folks said in your report, it is time for a paradigm shift in policy. Do you see a paradigm shift in any of those four platforms? Well, I'm working on the assumption that some of the people who wrote the platforms had read the expert task force on substance misuses um, two uh, reports. And if anybody hasn't read them, uh, they're sort of a wonderful group of experts who came together. I was lucky to be one of a number of people co-chairing. And there's uh, some really deep thinking on what needs to be done to improve uh, the lives of uh, people who use substances, but actually substance use policy in general in Canada. And that's uh, up on the uh, Health Canada website. And we really said that um, just more treatment and expanding treatment services, as uh, uh, lots of people have said, is a good thing, really good thing. We just don't think it will solve the problem. The problem isn't just more treatment. The problem is decreasing the number of people who need treatment. And the way you do that is by having better policy. And so lots of people have talked about uh, the war on drugs ending up being like a war on the people who use drugs. And so you need to decrease the number of people who are ending up in prison for simple possession of uh, drugs. Um, then some people have said, well, you know, people are using toxic drugs because they can't get a safe supply of drugs. So we need to increase the su safe supply of drugs. And some people, uh, including think people like the uh, global task forces that have been out there, have said you've got to go even further and you've got to think about regulating drugs, uh, regulating opioids like you like we regulate cannabis or alcohol uh, and working out how people can get a supply of, of that in a safe way. Uh, so that's where people are going. And it's that paradigm shift of saying, well, you know, we haven't actually managed to deal with the opioid crisis by uh, the war on drugs. We need to do something different. And we need to think about whether the road we've been going down uh, is actually going to work. And, and if I look at the platforms, as I said, it looks like the NDP and the Greens are talking about that. Uh, the Liberals have left the door open to that, saying that they are um, want a uh, strategy uh, to deal, uh, a big strategy to deal with the opioid problems, but they haven't uh, detailed that. Uh, and as you said in the previous question, uh, the Conservatives have moved over uh, a bit to, towards the centre, uh, talking uh, less about uh, criminalisation and punishment and penalisation and more about health and um, uh, and uh, uh, harm reduction, uh, which is a welcome step uh, in the right direction. Having said that, Hassan, the, and this is a question the Liberals get all the time, of course, and I'll put it to you here. They have been in power for six years, and when you see the Liberal platform say something like, introduce a comprehensive strategy to address problematic substance use to end the opioids crisis, uh, how do you react to that? Yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, we've been in an opiate crisis for five years. And I think, uh, 
you know, until we see action, they're just words on a paper and people continue to die. And so uh, I think, you know, I find it a little frustrating when it's been this long and we're still talking about creating a plan as opposed to actually implementing it. What would your view, Hassan, be on the issue of decriminalizing all drugs as a means to ending this crisis? Would that be a step in the right direction? It would certainly be a step in the right direction because we need to start looking at this as a health issue as opposed to a criminal justice issue. And criminalizing possession of, uh, you know, small amounts of drugs for personal use is not really getting us anywhere. It's just continuing this cycle of, you know, marginalization and pushing people out to the, the fringes of society. So it's certainly a step in the right direction. But, you know, we have a legalized source of substances when it comes to alcohol, and we still see tremendous harms from that. So it's not going to be the silver bullet that fixes everything. Now, Quam, when the current prime minister's father was the prime minister of Canada, and we're going back almost 50 years now to 1972, he struck something called the Ladane Commission, a member of the Supreme Court heading up this uh, committee that was looking at the decriminalization at the time of marijuana. It advocated that, and Trudeau, the father, decided not to go there. In 2019, Jane Philpott, who, of course, was the health minister and then resigned, uh, from cabinet and was kicked out of the Liberal caucus, said decriminalization of all drugs is not popular when you poll it. Question, is the decriminalization of all drugs advisable in your view? So you could have my view <laughs> or you could have the view of the Global Commission on Drug Policy. So there have been national and international commissions that have looked at this. And what they found is that when you go down the line of prohibition, that uh, the market and the market for a particular drug acts a certain way. So you make it illegal, and so trafficking becomes difficult, which means they make smaller, more potent drugs. And that's how you end up with hooch and stuff like that. Uh, in prohibition, you ended up with smaller, more potent alcohol if you... Uh, criminalize or uh, other substances, uh, the market produces things that are easier to smuggle, which is smaller and more potent. And that's what we're finding with things like fentanyl. Um, and that's what we found with just about every drug. And as they become smaller and more potent, the number of people who uh, end up with uh, serious consequences such as uh, the opioid crisis and the deaths increase, okay? So that's what we've got to think about. Uh, and then, of course, if you go full legalization, then people worry that you get an expansion of use of the drugs, which leads to more problems as well. So you've got to find the sweet spot, and some people say the sweet spot is regulation, where uh, you limit the uh, access and supply, but you don't criminalize and you make sure that people who need those drugs, who uh, are uh, uh, addicted to those drugs can get them. And so that's how people like the Global Commission have been thinking. And they're saying, if you're going to do that, dip your toe in the water to start off with, by using, by doing it in a drug with uh, smaller amounts of harm. And so you start with something like cannabis and then you work up to working, to making sure that you've got the legislative muscle and you've actually got the bureaucratic know-how uh, to actually get to uh, regulating something like uh, opioids. And so some people might see what the Liberals have done over a period of time as a sensible joined-up strategy towards, um, towards regulation. Other people would say it's not. <laughs> it's just one policy at a time. Uh, so it, it, you, we need to see where this goes. Uh, but certainly if you polled now compared to uh, when you're polling uh, just a few years ago, uh, I think you'd find slightly different results on the number of people who would support further uh, legalization regulation. So I think it may be different now, and I think uh, 
you know, Jane Philpott's uh, had a particular view at a particular time, but the context has changed. True. Okay. Uh, last 30 seconds to you then, Hassan. Whoever becomes prime minister after the 20th, what's the first thing they ought to do on this file? I mean, I think the first thing they need to do is uh, embrace this kind of large radical paradigm shift that Kwam and I have been talking about here today. Um, I think if you're asking me for a specific policy, I think probably decriminalization and looking at a safe supply are the two most important first steps because that's going to prevent people from, you know, experiencing the most immediate harms. But we have a lot of work to do. Hassan Sheikh and Kwan McKenzie, it's good to have both of you on TVO tonight. Thanks so much for your uh, wisdom and expertise on this. Thank you very Thank much. You for the Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.